Thank you for staying with us on Health Digest where we are highlighting pediatric emergencies, those pediatric emergencies that are commonly likely to occur in the household. We've looked at choking, we've looked at an unconscious child who needs resuscitation. On this second part, we are looking at a child who has sustained injuries either from a fall from a building or a fall from a tree and also a child who sustained burns. And we'll start straight away from a child who's fallen. It could be a building, it could be a tree. When this child has fallen, and let's say there's a parent or their caregiver is attending to this child who's fallen down, what are the immediate things that they are supposed to do? So the child is in a safe environment. As much as possible, maybe try and avoid moving the child too much, mm -hmm. because one of the things you're worried about is the fact that they may have broken their neck and you really don't want to you know, make it worse by trying to move the child uh, around unless you've really controlled you know, the circumstances under which um, they're able to, to move around. Check, is the child conscious? You know? Um, you know, is, is he still conscious? If he's not conscious, then that's when you want to do you know, these other maneuvers which we're going to, to show you. So uh, she puts, in, puts one hand on the baby's forehead, stimulates the child. The reason you're doing that is because you don't want the child to suddenly wake up and move their neck if they've already broken, because really any movement, as I said, is likely to, to worsen you know, the, the condition of the neck. They may be paralyzed. Precisely, exactly. So immediately after that, of course, shout for help, ensure that help is on the way, okay? Some ambulance, whatever it is that can provide help. So, yeah, just moving it slightly. So essentially what she wants to do, I'm just going to move in slightly just for the sake of demonstration. So notice she, she may either kneel down or, you know, just bend in sort of in a position where mm -hmm. her elbows are on the surface. You know, it could be the okay. ground, it could be you know, on a table, it could, whatever surface it is, her elbows need to be on, on, the, on, the, on the surface. The reason why is because she needs to stabilize herself. Mm -hmm. So that even she should not be, you know, standing up because even somebody pushes her, you know, there's a lot of activity around. Mm -hmm. She might topple over, you know, with with the child. And so therefore, if you're on the ground, you just kneel down. Yes, kneel down and put your elbows, elbows. on the ground. Okay. Okay. okay, and then both hands she puts them over the child's shoulders. Okay, and then she's going to perform what you call a jaw thrust. So essentially, what a jaw thrust means, she puts her thumbs on the baby's cheeks on both sides. Okay, so putting both thumbs on the cheeks and then with the index finger, okay, she's going to put them at the edge mm -hmm. of, you know, the, what we call, we call it the angle of the jaw, okay, so, so where the jaw sort of bends, you know, just, uh, you know, right there next to the ear. And then she's going to sort of, you know, using opposing movements of the thumb against, you know, the, the index finger, sort of try and open the mouth, okay, sort of make it fall open. So in the process of opening, you know, the mouth, just to ensure that, you know, the, the child can first of all begin to breathe, you know. So because if the mouth is closed, um, likely the child might not breathe as, as expected. So remember what she's also trying to do is to put both her hands against the, the child's shoulders. So she sort of stabilizes the child, the child's head against the body. Okay, so after that, because, you know, you can't maintain that position throughout, we're going to do, get what we call head blocks, okay? So for now we've used towels, okay? So using towels, which you've rolled up and you know, just applied some tape, so it forms a nice roll. So you put one head block on one side, and these are things that you can make quickly even at home. So she puts the other head block on the other side, okay? And she removes her fingers, and she does so and holds the child's head in that position and then you're going to get some tape which is right somewhere there okay and you can use uh, even just plain cello tape um, just anything that you can use to sort of secure you know these towers against the baby's head remember if you're having you know if it's a it's a, a bed with sheets remove the sheets so that you know you're taping the the child's head against the bed itself so you really don't want to tape on the sheets because the sheets will move you know mm. if, if you need to you know lift up the child and then the sheets might move and you know end up stabilizing so you're taping the baby's head against his head so you're running the tape right mm. over the towels okay and you cut you give me the second one so we give a do a second one this second tape goes over the child's forehead 
okay? And, you know, just that simple maneuver alone um, helps to stabilize the baby's head. Mm -hmm. So remember you're doing this in a child who is unconscious. If the child is conscious, then you have a bigger problem in your hands because likely this child will try and fight you, okay? So they'll try mm -hmm. and wake up and, mm -hmm. you know, try and, you know, because they want to be free and, and that kind of thing. Well, usually what happens is that if a child has actually gotten an injury on the neck, it's a very painful thing. So a lot of times you find this child will not want to move because any movement is very painful and therefore they will want to sort of maintain that position. So what you can try and do is explain to the child, I want you to stay still, okay, and I'm going to put these blocks around you, so just make sure you're fine. So it will take a lot of counsel. If you can get the parent, you know, just to be there, you know, talk to the child, you know, try and just keep him calm, okay, that alone might help. Um, Assuming this is a child on the ground, yes. there's no bed to tape all this. Yes. How do you stabilize the neck? So you may you may need to have somebody who simply holds the child's head mm -hmm. in that position, mm -hmm. okay, and sort of you know remain in that position until you know you can sort of transport this child, you know, into a vehicle. So um, maybe one of the things that you can also do is get you know even if it's a mattress or some hard surface, you know, material which the child can 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 lie on. And then what you do is, you know, put the, you know, the board, whatever it is, underneath. underneath. So you roll the child over to the side. Mm -hmm. While we you know, and we could do that. So let maybe let's simulate that. So assuming Rana is holding the baby's head, so you'll have a second person like myself who will come over. Maybe mm -hmm. put my hand over the child's shoulder and my other hand beneath okay. the the leg. And then we're going to perform something we call a log roll. So mm -hmm. at the count of three. Mm. We are going to, you know, turn the baby. So I'm going to tell Rana, the count of three, and we are rolling this child over to my side. Okay, so one, two, three. And then I'm going to ask you to put whatever board. As assume this is a hard board. Yes, assuming that is a hard board. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then at the count of three, we're going to roll the child back. One, two, three. Put the child back in that, okay, in that position. And then now, you know, do the head blocks. Mm -hmm. So tie now you are able to Yes, then to then you can be able to take the child okay. over to for for care. Mm -hmm. But remember again, we don't want the child to lie on the handboard for too long. Okay, so remember it's just an emergency transport um, you know device because if they lie on the board for too long, they can begin to develop what you call sores. Okay, and that's something you really don't want them to uh, to have uh, because it takes a long time for those kind of sores to heal. Okay, so usually get the child over to hospital. Remember, we are not advising you to use a collar in in, in children because a lot of time. I mean, previously we used to teach use a collar tied down. The child, but you find for a lot of child, uh, a lot of children, it's very uncomfortable. Sometimes it, it may cause a bit of blockage in terms of you know blood supply to the brain. Uh, so we're moving away from you know uh, suggesting that you use a collar. Mm -hmm. Just use head blocks. Usually they're sufficient. Mm -hmm. They'll get you to hospital, okay. and then you can be able to get further help. Mm -hmm. So once they're in the hospital, yes. uh, what should the parents or the person who's brought the child yes. to hospital expect yes. from you at the emergency department? Okay. So if the child is already not already on head blocks, um, those will be um, provided in that in that situation. So remember, of course, the initial assessment still happens first of all. Of course, just ensuring safety for the child, you know, establishing whether they're conscious or unconscious, and of course, you know, calling you know for for teams to come because usually this kind of situation is usually managed by by a team of doctors and nurses. Um, in some hospitals, you find they have what you call a trauma team, okay, which is a team that's already trained to function in those kind of situations or those kind of circumstances. They'll so call for that uh, team to come over. So in the meantime, the people, the personnel within the emergency department will put the child again in a separate place, apply their blocks if they're not already in place, and then begin, you know, the assessment. Assuming that the child is breathing and, you know, the heart is beating okay, so what they'll do is immediately just, you know, put some lines on, on the child. So they'll put, you know, large lines on, on both the child's arms and then administer maybe some fluid because some of the things that actually kill children who 
uh, have some kind of trauma. Either one is lack of oxygen, so you administer oxygen, or if their blood pressure falls, okay, for one reason or the other. Maybe they were bleeding, you know, because especially if they hit their head on the ground, um, you know, the head tends to be supplied with a lot of blood, so they can easily bleed out. So they fix lines so they're able to administer some fluids or they may request for some blood. Okay, and those are the immediate, you know, resuscitation measures. And then once they stabilize the child, well, the first thing they'll think of doing is either x-rays. Usually the x-rays of the head don't work very well. So in a lot of centers now we have what we call CT scans. Okay, so CT scan will be done to check, you know, if there's any sort of bleeding within the brain. Because if there's bleeding within the brain, depending on what kind of bleeding is happening, then that may determine whether or not a, a surgeon needs to come in and, and remove that bleed okay. or that clot so of blood. Because that clot of blood will cause pressure on the brain and you know, cause phone. complications for that particular uh, child. So in addition to that, they'll also do a couple of other x-rays just to check were there any other fractures, you know, uh, bony fractures. Could be the arm, it could be the leg, whatever it is that has broken. Okay, some cases they may also do additional tests, you know, like looking in, inside the, the stomach, okay, or what we call the abdomen, yeah, of, exactly. So they do an ultrasound check, is there any bleeding inside the abdomen, so that now they're able to deal with that, you know, so because excessive bleeding itself can worsen the child's condition, yeah. So this is a child, do yes. you expect an infant to come because of a fall? Well, it would be very unusual. You know, if you think about it, an infant cannot walk, yeah, or cannot, you know, you know, come out of, you know, fall from a balcony, for example. So if, if somebody comes and says, you know, my six-month-old baby fell from the balcony, I would want to question how did that happen, you know, and usually the first thing you think about is, is there some ongoing, we call it child abuse, or it could be, we, in our own terms, we call it non-accidental injury. In other words, this happened deliberately, you know, for one reason or the other. So there are certain clues or questions that we would ask, and there are certain things that we would look out for that would tell us likely maybe there's some ongoing child abuse. And such a situation might require for us to, you know, call in a social worker, maybe call in the authorities to try and investigate and find out what happened mm -hmm. in that circumstance, even as we treat that baby. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it would be very unusual for, say, a, a less than two-year-old mm -hmm. falling from a balcony, that would be quite, quite unusual. So let's look at uh, burns. Assuming this child has come in with burns, one of the commonest questions we get is, Dactaria, I say, my third degree burns, second degree burns, 50%. Yes. Yeah. How do you come with this? degrees and percentages there's, there's something we call the rule of nines okay so for example they they say that the baby's head is about you know two nines so you talk about 18 percent so if it's the entire head which is burnt you say maybe one arm is nine the other arm is about nine percent the front surface of the body is about another nine the back surface is another nine and you talk about also the you know in terms of we call them the lower limbs okay or the legs Okay, so another nine, another nine. If you add this whole total, it probably come to about 100%. And there are certain other areas of, of the body which are considered special areas if you get burnt. The face, um, if around the groin area, you know, um, you know, some of those special areas which we consider, you know, if you get a burn over that area, it's a lot more harder to treat you. Um, so therefore you need to be admitted, you know, to be managed. And then when you're talking about the degree, you're talking about the depth. Okay, so the depth of the burn. So depending on how bad the burn is, you can either have what you call the first degree burn, a second degree burn, or a third degree burn. So essentially a, a first degree burn is a very shallow burn. Okay, so just involving you know, the upper surface of the skin. Mm -hmm. And then you have you know, a second degree burn which involves almost the entire skin itself, you know, because the skin is also has layers, okay, so the, almost the entire, you know, skin itself is affected. Third degree burns, you're talking about the entire skin, including some of the structures which are below the skin. So this can include the muscles, can involve even the, the you know, the bones and, you know, those kind of surfaces. So obviously, and sometimes it's diff difficult for you to tell what is the degree of burn immediately a child comes in or even for an adult, it, it's not immediately apparent. It becomes apparent after some time, you know, after some period of treatment, that this is actually the, the depth of, of, of the burn. 
And depending on how deep it is, then it determines what sort of treatment what you get. So basically, when, when you do get a bounce, and remember, bounce uh, can occur for, for due to many reasons. Uh, one of the most common reasons why you know children get bounce is because sometimes you know mother was boiling water either for taking a shower or wanted to cook some tea. You find sometimes you know mother could be boiling the water on a jiko or even on a cooker, but you find maybe the handle is hanging out, you know, and the baby can simply hold the handle and pull it down and, you know, splash water on themselves. And that's a very, com very, very common, you know, reason for burns. When you come to a hospital, uh, one of the things that we do is to assess, you know, how extensive is the burn, you know, and uh, there are certain formulas that doctors use. Um, there's formulas that apply to adults and there are formulas that also apply to children mm -hmm. and they're sort of uh, different in certain ways. Mm -hmm. The reason why we want to know how extensive the burn is because it helps us to know um, how much fluids to, to give, you know, because once, you know, your skin is burnt, yeah. the skin acts as a barrier and it prevents you from losing water into the environment. You know, if you have extensive burns, um, ideally, you should be sent to what we call a BANS unit, yeah, which is what uh, helps you to manage such a child. Okay, so they have a specialist unit, it's like almost like an ICU, you're isolated, you're kept in a protective environment where, you know, management can be given or administered to that child, you know, for a prolonged period of time uh, to get, get them back to recovery. What are the things that somebody should do at home as they prepare to come to hospital and the things that they should not do yes. as they prepare to come to hospital because of a child who has sustained burn injuries? Well, I mean, sometimes we just say the first thing is to cool down, you know, the burnt area. You know, and sometimes it might be as simple as something as simple as just cool water over that burn surface area. Sometimes we just say just cover it, say, you know, with some clean dressing and then take the child to hospital. Uh, don't administer things like, you know, Vaseline because, you know, the oil itself sometimes may, you know, um, masten the burn to a certain extent. So there are certain creams that can be used to be able to treat those kind of burns. But usually the first thing we advise is just cool the area. It can be just as simple as putting the arm under you know, a tap of running water, so just to cool it. Because the heat itself is what causes you know, destruction mm -hmm. in terms of you know, the skin. And uh, I think that's just what I would advise for now. Yes. What other things do people do that they should not do, just apart from probably applying some jelly on top of the burnt area? Well, um, sometimes, I mean, people will stay with this bounce even at home, thinking that, you know, they'll, they'll somehow get treated and they'll get better. Um, and, you, and you find over time they get some, you know, some secondary infection and it becomes even worse over time. Or even just gets contaminated, you know, with, with soil or dirt, whatever it is. So sometimes it's just important to just make sure that that is, you know, is well taken care of. At least have somebody look at it. Uh, somebody is specialized to be able to provide, you know, the proper treatment for, so for they, it. When they, when they come to the emergency department, yes. what now do you do to this child who has sustained burns? Okay. And what are those critical areas that you are looking for, uh, hopefully, uh, hoping that they haven't gotten burned? Yes. Well, of course, some of the, the, the things that we worry, especially for what you call open filling uh, burns, is inhalation, especially in terms of smoke inhalation. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you find that, you know, with uh, when they inhale some smoke, it can cause, you know, uh, certain reactions again in the in the lungs, and sometimes even even just a hot steam, you know, from hot water. A child will inhale that, and initially they might be completely fine, but over time they begin to swell around, you know, around the what you call the airway. And it can become a dangerous thing, especially because if the swelling becomes really huge, then it, it, it can block, you know, the airway. So you would want to assess for some of those things. Um, so again, as part of your emergency care, your ABCs still come into play. Any final word on pediatric emergencies or emergencies that touch on children and infants? Yeah, so I, I think for me the, the key message here is prevention. If one can prevent it from getting there, because children are wonderful in the sense that they'll tell you long before they collapse that I'm, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick, please do something about me. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do something about me, I'm going to get there. I'm going to collapse. Okay, so if you can prevent 
a lot of these things. Uh, talk about it, like we mentioned, you know, diarrhea, vomiting, mm -hmm. give them fluids. Mm -hmm. You know, if a child, you know, is developing a pneumonia, get them checked out, you know, let them be seen, try and, you know, prevent these things by, you know, getting them vaccinated, you know, and keeping them warm. You know, there are certain prevention measures that you can do. We've talked about trauma. As we said, if your child is traveling in a car, doesn't have a car seat, please buy one. It will save you the millions. You might think that a car seat is expensive, but wait until you get to hospital. That's when you realize just how expensive it can be. Prevention is the key thing. Uh, don't get to this point where we have to do these kind of uh, maneuvers. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for right. these simulations. Yes. Many thanks for staying with us. Many thanks to the Aga Khan University Hospital Nairobi who's made this pediatric emergencies simulation a possibility. That's all we had for you today on Health Digest. God bless. I'm Dr. Masi Korir.